Super Bass. Um, thank you very much for taking time out um, to spend time with us today. I hope you get a lot out of the sessions, a lot of great people speaking. I know Sebastian's uh, speaking at me, I do uh, recommend that. Um, my name is Chris Tess O'Neill. I'm a senior consultant for a company called Coyo. We're, I believe, Europe's largest only SQL Server Specialists. Basically, we are Microsoft Virtual Technical Support Partners. What that basically means is that when Microsoft have a problem, um, they come to us in the UK, um, yeah. and, and we do a bit of work in uh, Holland and, and, and Germany as well. And essentially, um, <coughs> We just focus really on SQL Server. Now, my role within Coyo is I'm a, I'm a senior consultant and I'm a business intelligence specialist, which for those of you sat in there, I've got like that. We don't like the app, people being. <laughs> hey, here's a secret, neither do I. Uh, so, so, I sense that I work on VI, but um, prior to moving into VI, I was a Windows um, Active Direction Administrator. Um, I'm going with the SQL, and um, for those of you in our area, you know that my background is in a, I've got a business degree. Um, and essentially, um, I kind of evolved from being a Windows administrator into an EDA, then I moved into BI, and I've become a BI developer and infrastructure specialist. So that's Coyo. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP in SQL Server, and also a Microsoft Certified Trainer as well, with over 12 years experience in this area. Does anyone use Microsoft B Learning at all? B Learning courses? No, you do. So, for those of you that do SQL Server 2008 courses, I'm actually the sole author for the entire um, Microsoft Certified Technical Specialist track. So, I've got books written, I say books, they're in e books written on Transact SQL, database administration, database development, and business intelligence. So if you do use any Microsoft e learning, it's my ugly picture in front of the course. Anyone heard of SQL bits? Yeah, so I'm a SQL, I know you have. Can't keep you away. <laughs> so SQL bits, um, I'm one of the organizers of SQL bits, it's Europe's largest conference. We've just literally had um, the UK technical launch of SQL Server 2012. Um, over 1,600 people attended over the course of three days. Um, basically, a lot of content there around SQL Server 2012. One of the things I do want to mention to you, as I mentioned to people who were in before, a lot of my topics over the next two days are focused on technologies that can be used in other versions of SQL. So I'm, I'm not speaking, it's just going to focus on SQL 2012. Uh, quick show of hands, how many people use 2008? Yeah. So what I'm teaching you today, you can go back and apply to SQL Server 2008, okay? Um, <clears throat> it could equally be using SQL Server 2012 as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm rather agnostic in my approach when it comes to doing talks, because at the end of the day, how many people use 2012? Still one person. So there you go. So let, let's give you a technology. Uh, let's give you information about the technology that you can go back and use. I also run the UK SQL Server user group community, there's 12 of us. And for those of you who know me, like Tavaj, um, my passion and love in life is as a musician. Um, six years ago, I made a very, very conscious decision. I was at a crossroads in my life. I could either focus on being a SQL professional and really get my head down on that, or else I could be in a band who are currently touring Guns N' Roses and Metallica across Europe, up with the QPR, so I kind of, I'm gutted, quite frankly. <laughs> so this is my gig these days, I don't play on stages anymore, my gig is actually talking to you guys. So without further ado, this is the agenda today. <clears throat> the two areas that I want to look at for controlling our environments is a feature called the Resource Governor <coughs> and a feature called Policy Based Management. How many people have used resource governor and policy based management at the moment? A couple of people. So, what I want to impress upon you today is how these features can help you control your production environments and through hardware control, which is the resource governor, and through schematics and object control 
through the database engine. Um, you might not want people to create um, certain tables or certain names. You might have a corporate policy that states that every single database must be a full recovery model. We can basically use policy-based management to enforce compliance and standards within our organisation. At a reasonably little time, I think to actually set up any of these <coughs> is very quick. The difficulty with this is in the planning. So it's really important that whilst I don't focus on the planning for resource cover and policy-based management today, that when you go away, you certainly know how to use them, but you might not necessarily think about how to apply it within your business environment. So that's what we're going to provide. I've only got nine slides, ten slides. The focus really of this particular presentation is demo-based. So hopefully you'll have a pretty cool demo of these to, to have a full appreciation of how resource cover and policy-based management works. And basically what we'll do is we'll kick off with resource cover now. I do want to mention one thing, because I know some of you weren't in the room. People in England struggle with my accents, so I'm not offended if anyone in the room turns around and says, Chris, I don't understand what you've just said, please can you repeat it? That's fine, so call me out if there's something that I've not explained well, or, or my, my colloquialisms in my language comes out a little bit. <coughs> the other thing I'd like to say as well, please feel free to ask questions at any time, I'll endeavour to answer as much uh, uh, during the session itself. Resource Governor is cool. Um, how many people use Enterprise Edition of SQL Server 2008? Okay, so about a third to a quarter of the room. A quarter to a third of the room. It is an enterprise only feature, which is why we include policy based management as well, because policy based management is available in standard edition, so there's going to be something for everyone. But Resource Governor is responsible for monitoring and managing workloads as they come in and connect to your SQL Server system. And the idea behind it is that you can use the resource governor to control the memory usage and the CPU usage on your systems. So you could have an environment where you've got an instance running of SQL Server which contains applications for third party and bespoke applications developed in-house that are connecting up to your system. Now essentially, if you consider third-party applications, they typically create their own instance of SQL Server, install the databases that they'll use in order for their application to work. <laughs> now the problem with third-party applications, of course, is if that application is badly written, you usually can't change the application in order to improve performance because invariably it invalidates the warranty support that you get with that third party. So what Resource Governor enables you to do is from within SQL Server impose memory and CPU limits on that third party application without you touching that third party application. So from that perspective you have control. It's better than you would have had with SQL Server 2005 because we didn't have resource governor. But I have customers that essentially have bespoke applications and third party applications that are really overtaking the uh, physical resources on the SQL Server box. And particularly third party applications, they can't do anything about it because they don't get the support from the customer after. <coughs> it works really well with applications with similar requirements. What you'll find with Resource Governor is that you've got to have some way of identifying an incoming connection. Now you can identify that incoming connection by application name, you can do it by user account, there's a number of methods. And the reason why you can do that is because ultimately the mapping from your third party application to your SQL Server system <coughs> is defined by using a scale defined UDF. And we'll explore that in more depth during the demo. There are system monitor counters available, so you're going to see a demo where we make use of the system monitor counters to exactly demonstrate how resource cover is working. And the great thing is, is that your dedicated administrator connection is not subject to resource governor. So effectively, the system goes down and you need to get in there. Maybe you've got an application really, really taken over. That connections are omitted from resource, from resource governor. 
uh, restraints. Any questions so far? One question. Yes. If, if we have dedicated box yes. to SQL Server, we don't need resource storage. That's not strictly true because it depends on how many applications. So let me repeat questions. If we have a dedicated box to SQL Server, then we don't need to make these restrictions. I understand what you're saying, but it's more a point of how many databases do you have within that instance? How many applications are connecting up to that instance and making use of that single instance? So whilst you can offshoot or offload to another dedicated box, which is obviously a consideration that you should use, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you've got multiple applications top, uh, connecting up to that single instance and one of the applications is really poor, then you're still going to have a problem and resource company can help there. So yes, you're right, you could offload and you could think, you might think that you don't need resource governor, but if you've got multiple applications and one of them's bad, then you will need it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> so, what is the resource governor made up of? The resource governor itself contains what's called resource pools. Now, resource pools are resource governor objects that are defined, designed to represent the physical resources of the server. The physical resources being memory and CPU. Within SQL Server, there are two default resource pools. Those default resource pools are called internal and default. The settings for those is that the, min the minimum CPU setting and the minimum memory usage is 0%. And the maximum CPU and memory use is 100%. SQL Server uses the internal resource pool. Whilst you can change the minimum and maximum settings from where you want from 0 to 100%, I advise that for the internal resource pool, you don't, because this is used by SQL Server. The default resource pool is a resource pool that's used when you create a new resource pool, when you create a workload group, and you don't map it to a resource pool. So if you create a workload group and do not map it to a resource pool, it goes to the default resource pool by default. Like internal, it's got settings of not to 100% by default. What we typically do is we create our own resource pools that reflect the state of particular applications. So I might create one resource pool that's only got many of CPU from not to 50%. Yeah? Within resource pools, you create workload groups. And workload groups are objects that the classifier function will map to during those requests, those session requests. So workload groups is really the, the middle ground between your resource pool and your incoming connection. The classifier function is the glue. It's, it's the function that contains the logic that dictates how incoming connections are managed. It is simply using a scale user defined function. And all the rules surrounding the limitations and use of scale defined functions apply here. So as a connection comes in to a workload group, the workload group will read the classifier function. The classifier function will tell it which logic it should use to map it to the appropriate resource pool. And then it will take on the memory and CPU settings from that resource pool. Does that make sense? It becomes clear in the demonstration. <coughs> so, without further ado, let's get into it. What I'd like to do, I have a script, and to be honest, I'll give you um, a link um, afterwards to where you can download the script, so you can download and play about with it yourself. <coughs> yeah, so you'll get the slides, you'll get the scripts, and I'll use them. So the first thing to mention is that Resource Governor appears in the management, in SQL Server Management Studio, <coughs> and you can set this up both graphically and through TC, the choice is yours. I'm using TC because I can keep the script to quickly recreate it. Can you see the call at the back? Yeah? Yeah, perfect. So the first step in this demo is nothing to do with resource governor at all. What I'm doing is I am simply reconfiguring my laptop. I've got a dual core laptop, 
I only want to what, use one CPU. So I'm limiting my dual core laptop to only use one CPU. And I've got 8 gigs of RAM on this machine, and I want to limit the memory usage to half a gig. Right? So this is more to make it easier for me to do the demonstration without consuming my entire resources, because I'm going to max out the CPU during this demo. Okay? And I want to still be able to move about. The second part <coughs> is the creation of the resource pools. And we've got two resource pools that we're going to use. So we've got one resource pool called Pool VP. The Pool VP, imagine that you've got a vice president of the company, they've got an application that's just used for them, and essentially the vice president is basically get his top up. Their application gets the priority. The marketing ad hoc is another resource pool that's used by the marketing department. They have an application. And there's an ad hoc, there's an application that's used by the entire company for ad hoc requests inside their space. So what we'll do is we could go here, right click, and do a new resource pool. Yeah? Alternatively, we can use the create resource pool command, and that will create it for you. So if I refresh this, you'll note that we've got four resource pools now. <coughs> We've got the two default resource pools, which is default and internal, and now we've got the two user-defined resource pools, which is uh, marketing ad hoc and pool VP. If I double click and right click and go to properties, what you'll see is the actual memory and CPU settings, which is not 100%. Okay? And deliberately, for the purpose of this demo, with pool marketing ad hoc, I, at the moment, I'm going to leave it as those default settings 0 and 100. Okay? So at the moment, this is the behavior that's similar to SQL Server 2005. I think we might actually try that. Okay? Is that, is that fair enough? Are you happy with that? Okay. Now, what I'm going to then do is create the workload groups. Now, to create workload groups, I can expand the resource pool, right click workload group, and do a new workload group. Or alternatively, I can use the create workload group command group marketing using full marketing ad hoc. I create another workload group called group ad hoc using full marketing ad hoc. There is nothing stopping me from having multiple workload groups within the same resource pool. That, that's fine. So we've got two workload groups being mapped to one resource pool. And if I expand <coughs> this, they're created. And what I'm going to do is create the workload group for group VP. <coughs> and refresh this. And that is now created. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Okay. So the basis of this application is I'm now going to create three SQL Server logins, yeah? One called user marketing, one called user ad hoc, and one called user VP. Essentially, these will be the SQL logins that are embedded within your third party or bespoke applications. So when they connect up to your SQL Server, they're going to authenticate in SQL Server using that account. So I'm going to create those logins now. And those create. Now, the classifier function, remember, is a scalar function. It's only returning one result back. So what I'm going to do is first to make sure that I haven't got the classifier function in there to begin with. And then I'm going to create a classifier function that must return the value back in sysname and must have schema bindings. That's the requirement to use this in Resource Governor. <coughs> So essentially, we've got a situation where schema by, um, return system schema bindings is mandatory within the scale function in order to use it within the resource governor. So we've got to begin. We're declaring a variable called addVal with var32, and we're setting addVal to the value of default. Now, default is referring to the workload group default here. Okay? So if we don't specify anything, it's going to populate that variable with the default. However, <clears throat> if user VP is the S user underscore S name, are you familiar with that function? 
which will turn us back logging credentials, yeah? So if, if it's user BP, we're going to set the variable to group BP. That's the word logging. Okay? Else, if user marketing equals username, set the value of the variable to group marketing. Else, if user ad hoc is the username, then set the value to group ad hoc. And then we return that variable out. Okay? Does that make sense? So that ends, I'll just run this script. <clears throat> now, it's important that you store this in the master database. So in master database, under programmability, under scale of defined functions, refresh that. This is where it will reside because this is where the resource governor will look. Okay, for that function. So all we have to do now is map that classified function within the resource governor. Because if I go to the resource governor at the minute, you'll see there's a reconfigure pending which means I've completed this. If I go to the properties at the moment, can you see at the top we've got classified function name? It's not mapped to the classified function that I've just created. So in order to do that, what I will do is alter the resource governor with the classified function being called the classified function that I've just created. Yeah? Click on F5. <coughs> it may not have updated in here, but we'll have a look. Yeah, it has. So it's now changed there. So that's the glue. That's how we find the function within the resource governor. <coughs> Now, you can get in-memory information, sorry, you can get information about your resource group, so as you can see, group ID is uh, 2593 marketing, so just memory there. What you'll notice is the in-memory information from here will only contain the internal default because I haven't committed the changes to resource cover yet, okay? Once I've committed those changes, then we'll get the in-memory and metadata about it. So let's make those changes effective. Hit F5. Uh, let's go back to this and we should now get all the other resource pools that we've just created. So watch out for that. <coughs> um, what we also should get here, if I just refresh the board, not brilliant. Notice the reconfigure pending has now disappeared because I've committed those changes. Does that make sense? Is there anything you would like to ask? Shall we see it in action? So, what I'm going to do is firstly pull up, and just, just to let you know, all the green comments is very descriptive about what I've done. So, everything, we don't need to take notes because it's all in there. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the performance monitor, and within the performance monitor, um, we do have specific counters. <coughs> For resource governor. So if I go to SQL Server Workload Group Stats, I'm going to look at the CPU usage percent, and I want to manage the usage percentage for all of those workload groups that I've done. And if I scroll up, we've got a resource pool stats, expand resource pool stats, and we've got full marks and quality for the key. Now if I click on OK, we don't get anything at all at the moment because the resource cover is not working. Resource cover is not designed to capture short burst transactions. Resource cover is designed to pick up long running queries and manage them. That's the key point. So if you set up resource governor and you're thinking it's not doing much, it's because you've probably got short burst of transactions and it's just not picking up. Okay. It's designed to manage long running queries. So what I'm going to do is show you this batch file before I run it. And this batch file is a SQL CMD command that's connecting up to the instance called Manchester. And it's making use of the user marketing account with this password. And it's calling a file called CPU Intensive Loop. Okay? We've got a second connection that's using user VP, and that's going to call the CPU intensive loop again. 
and then I've got a third connection that's using user ad hoc, which will create a third connection to it. If we have a look at CPU intensive loop, quite frankly, it is a standard T SQL statement that's starting with a variable value of 2 trillion, yeah? And for each iteration of that loop, it's going to just select the version name, the version of the SQL server, and set that out and then decrease the count by one. And the reason why I've done that is basically to max out the CPU and I've got plenty of time to give this demo and I've got one out of time. Okay, happy with that? So, I fire up resource from the back. Okay, and we wait there. I just need to organise this a little bit because I'm quite keen for you to see what goes on here. Okay, so I'm going to have to dance around a little bit because the resolution. Right, let's fire up the first application. Bang. Now what happens is you'll see all of a sudden that my actual connection goes up to 50%. Does anyone know why? One CPU. One CPU. So remember I set the infinity mask with my laptop to be one, so I'm only using one CPU. Now if I basically take the tick out of pool marketing, the yellow is the group marketing, and that's because group marketing workload group, that's the first connection that I've initiated. Does that make sense? So let's see what happens when I fire up the second connection. All of a sudden, <coughs> group marketing drops down and pool VP in green, yeah, is now sharing resources with SQL Server. This is the default behavior in SQL Server 2005, yeah? Multiple connections, the fight lead out the share. If I hover over that, between them two, they are approximately using 25% of the CPU. Does that make sense? So let's see what happens now when I fire a third connection up, which is for the group ad hoc. We get changes occurring again. So we've got <coughs> user VP, user marketing, our user ad hoc are sharing resources here that is approximately 16.5%, which makes sense because 50 divided by 3, that makes sense. So we get the default behaviour of what happens with resource contention from a CPU perspective when resource cover isn't involved. Remember, my resource pools have not been changed. The CPU minimum is zero, the CPU maximum is 100% of the available CPU as seen by SQL Server. Okay, that's why we're getting a 16% split. Any questions so far? So this is what we're going to do. We are going to go back to the script. And I'm going to now alter the resource pool within the pool marketing ad hoc. So we use the alter resource pool statement. We can do this graphically as I was showing before. So effectively with the pool marketing ad hoc in here, right click, properties. And within that properties, once it comes up, I could make the changes manually in here. Okay? So I can basically go not and change that to 50. I'm just doing it programmatically from here. So I'm going to set the max CPU percent for the pool marketing and ad hoc resource pool to 50% of the available CPU. And then we're going to make that, we're going to apply it. Now if I jump quickly back into performance monitor, we see a change. As soon as I've altered that, if we look at Group VP. VP has jumped from 16 to 25, approximately. Yeah? Okay? And the reason for that is, is because we've limited the marketing ad hoc pool to 50% of the available CPU, which is only one CPU, so that's 50%. Yeah? So, user VP now gets 25%. If I show you the group marketing, that has now dropped down to approximately 12.5%.
Because remember, marketing and ad hoc are in the same resource pool. And we've limited that resource pool to 50%. So effectively, that's now dropped down to 12.5%, as has the group ad hoc. What you are seeing here is the behaviour of CPU contention once you start to apply resource governor metrics onto the incoming connections. Does that make sense? Any questions? So resource governor, in summary, gives you an opportunity to provide the ability to control the physical resources from incoming applications, particularly in scenarios where the application question is a third party application that you cannot change. If you can't change the application, at least you contain it within SQL Server by imposing resource government restrictions on it. Any questions at all? So what I'm now going to do is close down the three connections and we'll see the system monitor change accordingly as I change those connections. So as you can see, we've got the final connection going down and everything will flatline. Any questions there? Mm. Yes. Uh, can we change uh, the speed uh, of resources? Uh, can we change the speed of, of resources? Of resources. Uh, during time. For example, one application uh, has more uh, resources uh, during day and second during night. So what I would do is probably put that, if you, if, if you know the time when that's going to happen, you could do it as a SQL agent job, as a T-SQL command, yeah? Uh, a real good use as well, talking about matrices, is not only can you schedule that as a T-SQL command, because as you saw, I manually change the CPU to 50% on the client, so it is effective as long as you reconfigure it, but what I would do is do it as a SQL Server agent job, for it to run at a certain time so it can change it. A really good use for resource company is Max, uh, is PDCC. So in 2012, you have the ability to control the maximum degree of parallelism as well. So there's nothing stopping you. DBCC, you can't really control the parallelism. So you could create a mini application that runs DBCC as subject to resource government constraints controlling the maximum degree of parallelism in SQL 2012 only because that's got max stop settings. 2008 hasn't. So that's a really good use because sometimes DBCC plans can be very, very consuming and you basically want to give yourself a little bit of space with CPU and memory, uh, CPU in particular in this example, so you could do it that way as well. So to answer your question directly, if you need to change it, do it through a scheduled job within the SQL Server agent. Okay? Any other questions? Did you have any experience about using resource governor for the SharePoint or desktop databases? No. As yet, I haven't had that request through. But is there any sense using resource governor for these kind of databases? I can see where you're going with this, and the SharePoint administrator is going to love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's why I'm asking because yeah, yeah, yeah. we have also SharePoint databases and SharePoint farms. And, yeah. uh, so the key point is the logic contained within resource governor is held by the classified function. Yeah? And the classified function is a scale defined UDF. Subject to limitations of UDFs that you know, yeah? So you've got to ask yourself how can you identify the SharePoint connections coming in? Yeah, now you could do it through the example I use with the user, the, the S user S name function. But it's not the best way of doing it if all your applications are using the same account to connect it up to SQL. So the other alternative is, is to identify it by the application name. So use the application name and identify the incoming connection by application name, and then you can control it that way. Does that make sense? But there are many different ways you can identify. You need to find out the best way you can identify that from SharePoint and create a scale UDF that reflects that logic. But mainly, uh, resource governor is not used for uh, which one is SharePoint? I have no, no records of my customers using it 
to control SharePoint, and if you do, good luck. I just want to be curious. <laughs> I've got a good feeling you might need coffee and I'm to help you out there, because it'll just kick off big time. I work a lot with SharePoint people because I do BI infrastructure, so I know I get a little bit precious about their environment. So we've just seen the resource governor, which is one method you can use to control um, your SQL Server states. Um, we've also got policy-based management. Now, the policy-based management, really, this is just the primer. We've, the time I've got left, 25 minutes, and what I'm really giving you here is a primer on how to use it. I have some, seen some fantastic implementations <coughs> of policy-based management, and I do recommend that you go to uh, connect.microsoft.com because there is a fantastic script there that makes use of policy-based management to manage an entire SQL Server state based on the addition, sorry, based on the version of SQL Server that you are using. So how many people use policy-based management? Okay, so from your perspective, you probably know a lot of this already, so I apologise in advance, but I hope this was covered was useful for you. Um, but for the rest of you, I think you'll find this as a really good primer to find out more information um, about policy based management. And one thing I didn't mention as well, SQL Bits, we have over 500 videos for free to download at your disposal. So if you take a browse there and you want to get serious, Ramesh is speaking tomorrow, he's got sessions up there, Denny, Klaus, uh, all their have sessions, I have sessions. So I do recommend that if you want to learn anything about um, um, new areas of SQL Server, go to sqlbits.com and download the videos. I will hold my hand up, the website sucks at the moment. You need to improve the user experience in browsing those videos at the moment. It's only done on the speaking end. Uh, we're looking at improving that so we can do it by track, by discipline. So what is positive based management? Well, basically, it's enforcing configuration standards rather than physical resources. So whereas resource governor is about the physical resources, policy-based management is about enforcing configuration uh, within an instance of SQL Server. The good news is, is that you can use it on all editions. Okay, so I like resource governor where you're limited to enterprise edition. And it can be used to centrally manage multiple servers. So even though you're just getting a taste of, of policy-based management here, you can use it in conjunction with central management service so that you can export policies in an XML format and apply those policies across the entire enterprise using central management service. So the ability to create those policies uh, means that not only can you apply those policies to service, but before you apply them, you can actually evaluate whether they're appropriate or not to that particular realm of SQL service on which the policies are going to be based. So what are the components that make up policy-based management? Well, at high level, we've got, the, we've got um, the, the policy. And the policy is a SQL object that literally holds information that is used to enforce the policy itself. So basically, it's the high-level objects on which the policy will be based. Now, you can apply policies to different facets within SQL Server. The best way I can explain facets is that a facet is an object that represents a particular component of SQL Server. And to be honest, you can't create your own facets, but there are enough facets in there for you to have a wide range of control. So to give you an example, there isn't a facet called Service Broker. The reason why is because they give you facets for each individual components of a service broker. Yeah, so you've got the root objects, you've got the contracts and so forth. So even though you can't create your own facets, I do believe there are enough facets there to give you um, basically everything that you need to really enforce these compliance standards on your SQL Server instance. <coughs> now the target is the object such as an instance of SQL Server or a database to which that policy can apply. So you can actually apply policies remotely um, to other SQL Servers or you could do it to individual databases. And finally, the condition is the allowable state of the policy. So effectively, the condition is the logic that dictates what kind of 
policy standard will be enforced on a particular object. So, you know, it, it'll, it'll, it'll make more sense as I go through the demo and, and create each of these items for you. But we'll give you a very simple example for you to walk away. So how are policies ever enforced? Well, you could enforce them if you wanted to manually. So there's nothing stopping you from, once you've created your policy, right-clicking that policy and running it so it will manually enforce it. But this is typically not the way you would do it. You could do it on a scheduled basis, and scheduled the manual can apply to all facets, yeah? So effectively, if you don't want to do it manually, you can schedule it. So the, the benefit of this, it'll run at a certain point in, in the day. The downside is, is that you could change an object within SQL Server that completely violates a policy. Yeah? And unfortunately, it will have that setting until the schedule kicks off and enforces that policy, so that's the downside. As we get lower down the list, they apply to less and less facets because on change prevent and on change log only are essentially using EDL triggers and event notifications to prevent those changes. So essentially, you could have some of the, um, someone's changing the table definition, that could be done on change prevent, so basically it's done immediately. Okay? They're just using different internal mechanisms, video triggers from change event and event notifications on change log only. So you've got a wide range of options for how you want to enforce those policies, but as I mentioned right at the beginning of this session, using it is straightforward, planning for it takes a little bit of time. So I would advise that you need to have a clear strategy on what policies you want to enforce and what would be the um, appropriate enforcement methods to use for a given facet itself. So let's give you a, a primer on, on policy-based management. So within Management Studio, policy-based management is two above resource um, governor. Um, like resource company, you can do it through the GUI, you can do it through um, TC4. In this particular example, I'll do it through um, the GUI this time. So what we've got within policy-based management is you've got policies, conditions, and facets. Now let's have a look at the facets to begin with. So these are the list of facets <coughs> that are at your disposal with regards to policy-based management. Okay? And essentially, each facet contains properties, okay? So there's plenty of properties within each facet for you to control. So for example, from a database perspective, we've got name highlighted there, uh, we've got size, and so forth. And, and typically what you'd be doing is you'd be applying conditions based on these properties to each individual facet itself. As I mentioned, with facets, you can't create any. Yeah? We're fixed. You've got your conditions and you've got your policies. And it doesn't matter which way you create them, to be honest. It's up to you. But one thing you need to bear in mind, with conditions, if I create a new condition there, what we'll do is give that a name, uh, or a simple one. We're covering that with all. And then what we choose is the facet to which the condition will apply to. So we'll put database, and within the database, when we come to add the expression, the field is the other name for the property. So what this will do is it will give us a list of all the properties within this, and for example, we will choose the recovery model. Now, the recovery model, as we all know, is very thick, so it'll give you a drop down list of options, yeah? But if we were to choose a property like name, your condition value is usually based on a string, yeah? So you've got more options at all, you might want to do percent. Maybe have a name in standard in your databases that must be enforced. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create full recovery model, as so our recovery model for condition. Now in my experience, it's best if you can try and keep these, if you keep them too targeted, 
you can only plan to certain policies. So as much as it's easy to set this up, you, 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 there's a data that as time goes on, you're going to have loads of conditions and three, four years down the line, you're going to have to go through a maintenance process of right, which ones are we using now, which ones aren't we using in the title. So try not to think about how we want those conditions to be done. Obviously, you can put a description in as well. So we click on OK, we've got our recovery model pool, and to create our policy, we right click, choose new policy, and within this policy window, we give it a name, uh, instance, oops, recovery models, and we map this policy <coughs> to a condition we created. So as you can see from here, I can make use of the recovery model pool that I've just created, but there's nothing stopping me to create a new condition from within this window, and we're back to the window that I've just demonstrated. So in this instance, what we'll do is we will check it against the condition recovery model pool, and as you can see, here are our targets, so we can basically change that for every set of new condition for your targets as well, so there's nothing stopping me to apply conditions not just to policies but also to targets. So we can do a new condition for that. In this case, what I'm going to just do is for every database. Here's our evaluation mod, okay? And in this instance, for this particular class set, we've only got the two on demand and on schedule. So we're just going to do it on demand, which means I'm effectively going to manually process this. If you do on schedule, we do get the uh, schedule picker and the ability to create a new schedule for that to run. And then finally, you can basically apply it to any specific server you want. So this involves uh, creating a condition against the instance uh, asset in order to find the instance being a specific server. So there's a lot of flexibility with where these policies can be applied. Once that's done, Click on OK, and what you will note is by default, the actual policy is disabled. So right click and enable it. Okay? I'll just pick So we'll enable that, okay? And the other thing to mention as well is the policy-based management uh, may be disabled as well, so make sure that policy-based management has been enabled for the policies to apply as well. So just keep them in mind. Okay, so how do we make use of this? Well, of course, from a schedule perspective, thank you. From a schedule perspective, you know, it'll kick off at the time to the states and the lines there on the super server agent. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to do it manually. So, essentially, what I'm going to do is, with this policy, I will evaluate this policy. Okay, now what you can see here is if we select this policy, we have a situation where we've got an SMR reference here to two databases. So, one database has a red cross. And that's the AdventureWorks BW 2012, which basically says it's not in compliance. And the other one is the database called Test, which says it is in compliance. And if you click on View, what you've got is the condition recovery model is full of the expected value, but what we've evaluated is that the actual value of your AdventureWorks database is currently simple. Okay? Likewise, we get confirmation there of the test database that this is in compliance because the condition states full and the actual database itself is full. So what we can do is we can review that, yeah, and then we can apply the policy against this particular instance. And what it will then do is force the change within, in this case, the AdventureWorks database to make it compliant so that it's now a full recovery model, and this can be confirmed by going into the properties of this database and looking at the options. Yeah. Okay. 
The mechanics of using policy-based management is very straightforward. Yeah, policies, convictions, and applying uh, access. Think carefully before you go full on in using this. Identify what areas of your SQL Server need to be compliant. List them down. Find out the associated facets for those areas that need to be compliant. So as I mentioned earlier, if you need to enforce standards with service broker, there isn't a service broker facet, but there are certainly facets that reflect each object within the service broker. By having a plan, you'll be able to use this very effectively. And I do recommend going to connect if you want to use policy-based management in the enterprise and downloading the Codeplex. It's Codeplex that it's on, yeah. Downloading code, go to codeplex.com and download the policy-based management for the enterprise because this gives you a really, really good example of how policy-based management can be used across an entire SQL Server state. In fact, if you want to find out more information about, um, about using policy-based management in the enterprise, Martin Cairns, who's a consultant out in Melbourne, Australia, came to SQL Bits and did um, a presentation on it, which is called Simplified Management putting your feet up. Martin Cairns is there, so if you want to watch that video, go to sequelbits.com, click on the speaker's link, look for Martin Cairns. This um, very presentation is also available on video as well. So if you go to sequelbits.com, go to speakers and look for Chris Testo O'Neill, um, look for the video for We Have Control, Control and Resources and Sequel Resources. So if you need a reminder of what we've discussed today, you can see it visually in a one hour session there. So policy-based management and resource government together really, really can give you options for enforcing compliance both at a physical level within SQL Server and from um, a database um, schematics or settings level. So in summary, the flux of the resource cover, I hope it's given you some ideas on how this might be able to be used within a SQL Server. We know that we have to think about how we group our applications together and applications of similar requirements really should be using the same resource pool. You asked the question earlier on about SharePoint and this is summed up by this point here. How are you going to identify your applications in the classifier function? You quite rightly deduce that username as a method for doing that will not work all the time. So you, there are other alternatives you can use, such as identifying application names. Monitor its behaviour. Yeah, you've seen how in um, performance monitor we can use counters to observe the effects of resource governor on the fly, and we can make changes on the fly. Uh, we suggested earlier as one solution you could schedule those changes through the SQL Server agents. Policy-based management, more of a primer. It's got a whole world open to it, but you do now understand the components that you need in order to get this up and running, so please make sure that you plan appropriately for its usage within your enterprise. Assets are fixed, you can't change them, but we've got plenty of them that should meet your requirements. And policy enforcement, how are you going to do it? Schedule, through DDL triggers, through event notifications, or indeed, are you going to do it manually? Are there any questions about anything I've discussed in the last hour? Okay, so can policy-based management be used to compare settings on one system, yeah, compared to another system, an example being dev environments versus production environments, yeah? In answer, you can, use, you can use the evaluate, you can export out policies, yeah, import them onto the production server, and then evaluate that policies, <coughs> um, the policies against the settings in production. Therefore, you are not comparing one server against another server, you're comparing policies against that server. So if you're enforcing those policies on that dev server, yes, 
then you could argue that that is a fair reflection of those settings on there. But are you talking about are you talking about object configuration, or are you talking about schematics? Yeah, but are you talking about the differences in settings or the differences in settings? Then I would basically, um, you can use policy based language that's currently used on one server to enforce those standards and then move that across and evaluate it there, but it's not a foolproof mechanism. Yeah, please bear that in mind. That's the caveat. At the end of the day, there's nothing to say that there's an object in there that is violating the policy, so it isn't really a true reflection to be honest. So, in short, it could be done with policy based management, but it's not something that I would say would guarantee that it reflects the environment that you've taken it from. Any other questions? Are you able to automatically enforce um, not, uh, uh, policies which are not uh, compliant? Are you able to automatically enforce? Policies that are not compliant. Yep. Well, if, if the policy is not compliant, then you will change the policy to make it compliant. If not, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Change the, the object to be compliant with the policy. Oh, so, so you can work. Can it be done automatically? Um, with certain facets, you would use the DDL and the event notification, but that does not apply to all of the facets. If you look at the example I gave, which was on the database facet, the only options we had was on demand, which means manually, or on a schedule. Yeah, but I don't think it's about something else. Um, uh, you have the possibility to apply um, a policy to non-compliant object um, after the policy was uh, scheduled and run. Yes. But are you able to automatically uh, uh, change the object so it will be uh, compliant with the policy? No, not for all objects. For some objects you can, because the method of enforcing that policy is done through DDL triggers or event notification. But it, unfortunately, to answer your question, yes it can be done on a certain set of facets. And if you look up policy based management on books online, it will tell you which facet can be enforced through DDL triggers and event notifications. So those facets can be done automatically. But for those facets that don't support DDL triggers and event notifications, like the database facet, then you can't. Yes, yeah, so we are uh, saying that um, enforcement is, uh, when the enforcement is possible, we can. Uh, we can go up the settings uh, which we want to keep. Uh, yes. So the point of enforcement, you can change the settings. Yes. Yeah. But but you cannot automatically uh, switch settings to uh, on objects to comply with the policy. Uh, on yes, you can. If that object supports yes. the um, event notification. But you cannot automatically apply uh, uh, changes on objects which are not uh, um, available uh, with the uh, old triggers. Correct. That's exactly it. Yeah. So you need to manually uh, apply a policy. Manually apply the policy or do a schedule or set it to a schedule so you know that at 10 o'clock at night it's always going to enforce that policy. Which is why, really, what you're summing up there is that you need to think about the planning. You need to think carefully how you put this into place. Yes, but, but while um, watching the report, you can uh, switch the settings of, of a particular object to comply with the policy. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about uh, uh, automation of this process. So you, you don't need to uh, manually uh, revert settings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I understand. So you so you think about automating the process. You don't have to keep manually changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, absolutely. And you should think about that. Um, so effectively, out of the box, yeah, some can, some can. So you need to think about. Any other questions? Can I thank you for taking an hour of your time out today to listen to me draw on? Um, I hope it's been extremely useful to you. If you do have any other questions, I'm available to answer them at the side of the stage here. But thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to call and I really enjoyed it so far. Thank you. Cheers.